All right. Can people hear me up the back? If I speak in about this... Yep. Excellent. Good. Right. All right. So I would just like to initially um, uh, thank everyone uh, on BSD Cam for inviting me to speak in front of all of you lovely people. And <clears throat> in full understanding and acknowledgement of that, thanks, I would like to present a live reading of Bezels by, Bedazzled by Blockchain by Michael... Sorry. No. <laughs> George Neville Neal could not be here, so, and it wouldn't feel right doing this without him, um, which, which is a tragedy. Link. Um, so I came up with the name of this talk around the same time that I came up with the first sort of rough idea of it, and it seemed to fit really well, especially when I went to Wikipedia and saw that you know, tragedy is a form of drama based on human suffering um, that invokes an accompanying catharsis or pleasure in audiences. And I figured there was plenty of drama in here and suffering to go around in System D. And so I figured that it was, it was a good way to go. Um, another thing that really came into it when I was developing this talk is this piece by Oren Shaw called Contempt Culture. Um, it's a really interesting piece and it's kind of confronting sometimes because in a lot of the communities that we're in, part of the way that we show that we're in the community is by heaping shit on the other communities. And that kind of sucks. You know, your, your Python developers heap crap on the Perl developers and the Perl developers heap crap on the PHP developers. This piece is very focused on language stuff, but we kind of do that too. Um, and so I highly recommend that everyone reads this. And the other thing that I think goes into this uh, discussion is the notion of change. Um, th change threatens a bunch of things, um, the most obvious being familiarity. And familiarity feels really comfortable um, because it's the thing that we're used to, but occasionally it's really good to reassess what the, the familiar and decide you know, whether we need to change it or not. Um, the other thing that I learned, not from the Wikipedia article but from someone else, is that tragedies apparently also come in five parts. So uh, let's start with part one. Um, in the beginning, there was Unix. Well, actually, no, there was plenty of stuff before Unix, but you know, Unix is a good point to start. Unix was a happy accident. If it hadn't been developed by those people in that place at that time, um, under those circumstances, we would not have had the thing that we know as Unix. This kind of pathological profusion of, of implementations of, of roughly the same thing over and over again. Um, and, you know, which led to this notion that, you know, we, we, you know, we may have FreeBSD and NetBSD and OpenBSD, we may have Linux, we may have a whole bunch of other ones, but we all think kind of the same way to some extent. Um, Unix, as most people who've studied it know, uh, was a reaction to previous system that it was, tr it was brutally simple. Um, and it took a fairly brutally, brutally simple approach to bootstrapping user space. Um, init. Init's job is to get user space going. The kernel starts up a process, calls it init, it executes this, and it's invoked as the last step of the boot procedure, and generally its role is to create a process for each typewriter on... hang on. Um, so when init comes up multi-user, it invokes a shell with input taken from etc. RC, yeah, we know that bit, uh, performs housekeeping functions, and then it reads TTYs and creates a process for each type... Sorry, that manual's from 7th edition Unix. Um, but that said, it still sounds a lot like what init does today on the BSD systems especially. System 5 went a bit different, but we can get to that. Um, but one bit of um, language that really jumped out at me from this one was housekeeping functions like mounting file systems and starting daemons. Calling that a housekeeping function, I mean, yeah, it is, it's keeping your house in order, but, you know. Um, but given the context, though, in this case, this is the PS output from 7th edition Unix. Uh, that's it. Um, you've got Swapper, which is the kernel. You've got init, which is actually being Getty, uh, what we would now know as Getty. Um, you've got cron, and you've got a thing called update, whose job it is to update the super block every now and then. Um, then, if you fast forward, this is 4.3 BSD. You'll notice that the only real difference that we've got here is that we've now got some inet Ds and route Ds and a syslog D. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, this one, this one actually comes in through Telnet, whereas the other one was actually on a, a console. Um, so INETD has an interesting place in history. Um, original internet services ran through INETD. Um, Telnet, FTP, Finger, all of these um, would 
I know they would listen on a socket for them, and when the connection came in, it would start up the appropriate thing and hand it the, the file descriptors and off it went. Um, this turned out to be not well suited for things with lots and lots of persistent state. And so, you know, things changed a bit. Um, just before I move on, big shout out to the Living Computers Museum and Labs who gave me access to those machines. They will give you access too if you ask nicely. Um, so, things changed. I, I, you can, it seems a bit glib to say that the internet happened, but, you know, that, that was, that kind of feels like it to a, a lot of people, especially from my point of view. You had suddenly these big applications that were serving out lots and lots of state to, over the internet. You had databases, you had uh, caches, you had web services that had to keep internal state and all that kind of stuff. And so you started to get a much stronger notion of a service um, as a superset of what we would previously have called a daemon. Because um, a service can be dealt out via a whole bunch of things. Like it's, it's quite often a collection of processes and quite often a collection of other services operate, operating in concert to do something. And init and RC can start these things, but then they kind of get out of the way and don't do anything else unless you manually get involved. The only things that by default automatically get restarted on, for example, a FreeBSD system is basically Getty and anything else that's pretending to be Getty. Um, system 5 got around this by basically extending that notion out to anything within it tab. Um, but again, it was a single process that you could manage and it was still like, I mean, they had bloody run levels, it was painful. Um, but going back to this statement here, it's not the only housekeeping function. It's, it's, starting daemons is not the only housekeeping function. You're also mounting file systems. And that can also be, that notion I think deserves to be a kind of separate stream of things that happen at this point. It's not, this isn't service management or service bootstrap. This is system configuration. This is getting your system into a running state. Um, and this incorporates, in, includes things like uh, configuring your network interfaces and configuring the runtime linker and all that kind of stuff. And so you end up with this confusion between system configuration and service bootstrap within the RC structure that we have. And it can cause a bit of, a bit of confusion because you're using the same metaphors and the same processes to manage slightly disparate things. And this is one of the things that we don't often see because we're familiar with it. We're used to saying, it, you know, it's service, I don't know, pick one at random, you know, service HTTPD stop or restart or whatever. But then we try and also apply that to the notion of restarting our network, which may or may not involve stopping and starting daemons depending on whether you've got DHCP or WPA supplicant or any of those things. But it could also just be if config. And what, uh, what uh, the traditional RC system really doesn't do is automated service management. You can bring in other tools to do that, like Runit or Supervisor D or various other things, but that is bringing in third-party stuff that thinks a bit differently to the way that everything else does. And so you, you kind of need to... You, you, it's this other notion of, of bringing in other things that you suddenly have to think of the way it thinks, the way you, the service you're managing thinks, and various other things, which again, we kind of get used to. Like if you pick run it and you install it, you kind of get used to the way run it thinks. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the impedance mismatch between what run it does and what RC does is good. Um, and the thing is that other things do manage services quite well. Um, Windows has always had a really strong notion of services. Um, it's led to some security issues. Um, but the fact that they actually had a notion of you can write this thing as a service and we will manage it for you as long as you follow this contract, that's been kind of neat. Um, Mac OS and iOS also have a very strong notion of, of services, at least now with th things like LaunchD, which is a really good point to get into what SystemD actually is. So, interestingly, SystemD really does start with LaunchD in a bunch of ways. Um, LaunchD replaced a whole bunch of event, what, what I would term event handling daemons on Mac OS. So, Bootstrap is an event. Um, 
the you know, cron and at give you time-based events. Um, INETD gives you socket type connection events. Um, you also have other events like devices arriving uh, or departing or network state changes. It also adds service management in the form of process exit events. So LaunchD will keep a process running for you. And the idea of LaunchD kind of coincided with, the idea, with Apple moving a whole bunch of its functionality that we would normally perceive of as being in system libraries into system service daemons. So for example, aggressively moving uh, the backing of calls like get pwint so to get user information and all that kind of stuff into a directory services daemon. And if you need to have that running all the time and you can't declare the system as having booted until they're all started, then that's a pain in the ass. But if you can say, we know that we're going to need this at some point, but we're not going to start it until we actually need it, that can speed things up and make things more efficient. And also you can kill things off in a low power situation, knowing that they can be restarted as needed. And so this was part of a, an overall sort of shift in the idea that, that Apple took. Apple can also do this because a lot of their stuff goes over Mark and messaging, and they already have an established notion of, of RPC for, and inter-process communication that's fairly rich for doing that kind of stuff. And what I find amusing occasionally is that a lot of people who bitch about systemd don't bitch about launchd, but I find that funny because systemd is basically launchd in concept. Um, in 2010, um, Leonard Puttering uh, was looking at how to manage services on Linux. And he was looking at Upstart from Canonical, which was the, the one that existed at that point, which was also event driven, uh, but it still used old school shell scripts. Um, it could handle more event types than init could, which let's face it isn't hard because init basically deals with it booted and it going down. Um, um, but Leonard Pottering felt that it didn't do enough with things like dependency ordering. And also I get the impression based on some of what he's said and done that he really just likes the way Apple thinks in this regard. Um, Good thing to look at for this one is Rethinking PID1, which is a blog post by Leonard Pottering himself. This is the one that actually introduced systemd. It goes into quite a bit of detail about the rationale behind it. Um, and you, you get quotes like, uh, for a fast and efficient boot up, two things are crucial, to start less and to start more in parallel, which is fairly obvious. Um, it, it doesn't mention boot speed a lot. It's not actually overly concerned with fast boot. It's more concerned about stuff around that. Um, an init system that is responsible for maintaining services needs to listen to hardware and software changes. In this, he I, understands the need for a system, a modern system, to be reactive to its environment. Old school Unix systems were very static. Modern systems are a lot less static. Servers may be still relatively static, but most of the devices that move around, laptops, phones, anything like that, needs to be reactive. And even um, Systems in data centers might need to react. For example, uh, I used to work at Isilon, and Isilon systems need to react to devices coming and going as well, because they're in clusters, and clusters occasionally lose things. Um, and then he also specifically calls out that he's ripping off, off LaunchD. Um, and one of the things that I found from reading this and then looking at what systemd actually moves to is systemd is about system management which is an interesting concept because I think it means that with systemd, they, there's actually understanding of something that I think is also understood in other places. Um, we tend to think of the universe as being user space and kernel. So the kernel has devices and a bunch of other stuff and then user space has all the code that we actually wrote except if we're kernel developers. Um, but the thing is that dynamic stuff is often better managed through user space than it is through kernel code. And I think that Windows natively understood this from the beginning. Mac OS definitely understands it. With systemd, you actually understand that there's a layer in there in the middle called the system layer, well, I'm, which I'm calling the system layer. Um, and so systemd implements that system layer for Linux by bringing in a bunch of code that manages various system functions like network connectivity, time, device management, and all that kind of things that just don't necessarily belong in standard user space, but also don't necessarily belong in the kernel. So 
And the thing is that on top of that, it doesn't really do it in a way that everyone finds familiar, which I think is part of the source of the angst to it. Um, but it does give you an explanation as to why it sees the need to bring in things like Network Manager Code, UDEV, Time, Resolver Libraries, because all of those things are systemic services they are getting provided to user space. So how did that work out? <laughs> Find out. Um, so System D has been fairly widely adopted. I mean, it hasn't gone into every single distribution, but I mean, between them, all of these um, distributions here, the, this is the version in which System D became the default and when it happened. Um, but, and between those, you've covered a lot of the Linux using universe. Um, it's worth noting that um, Fedora, Red Hat, and CentOS are all managed by Red Hat, where Leonard Pottering works. But if you actually go and read in, Red Hat management was not particularly big on the idea of System D at first either. So it's, I think it's a bit of a testament to his determination that he actually got it out there. Um, Debian had very long and acrimonious debates about it, um, which should surprise nobody who's watched the Debian project. Um, but they had good reasons for that in a way. Mo they, ha they run multiple kernels for a start. You can get Debian that runs on top of the FreeBSD kernel. Um, they, um, and generally, they're a kind of uh, project where you do get a lot of debate and stuff like that. They ended up going with System D in the end. Uh, there was a lot of contention around that vote, and a lot of people who were involved in that debate ended up resigning. Um, Ubuntu uh, basically followed Debian's lead on it. And so moving through the rest of this section, I kind of want to look at some of the complaints that people have about System D and just sort of address them a bit. Number one, um, there's a lot of suggestions that it violates the Unix philosophy, which I usually take to mean that you want to write software that does one thing and does it well and then connect it to other things. System D as a project contains a lot of things. System D as a daemon is a thing that reacts to events and starts things and does it very well. And so you could claim that it does not actually violate the Unix philosophy. You could claim that there's a bit of violation in that it's bringing all of this extra functionality into the project. But I think for BSD projects to criticize another project for bringing a bunch of tangentially linked software into one repository to manage it collectively, <laughs> that's a bit rich. Um, another complaint is that it's bloated and monolithic. I mean, this is, again, it's not really one binary. There's a bunch of things that all work together to do something. Um, you can claim, again, that it's bringing a lot of functionality into one project, but, you know. um, but it, it all kind of fits with their stated project goal if you, if you interpret their project goal as providing the system layer for Linux. Um, a lot of people claim that it's buggy. It's software. <laughs> um, I mean, I had a look th I've had a look through a couple of bugs that have shown up there. And yeah, there have been a few howlers, but then you know, we've all had fun bugs like that show up. Um, there's also the suggestion that because it's PID1, it somehow needs to be held to a higher standard, which again is true, because if PID1 crashes, so does your whole system. But they seem to have a fairly defensive way of dealing with that in that system D, if it crashes, will actually not exit. It will just go catatonic and let your system keep running until you've got a good time to reboot it. And on top of that, that kind of presupposes that we can never write a new PID1, which I think would be unfortunate. Um, I think this is one of the areas where change is something that needs to be managed and done carefully, but it doesn't need to be completely stopped. Um, another big complaint. Um, <laughs> so open source communities are fun places. Ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> is it July 4th yet? Um, so Leonard Pottering looks like an interesting guy in a bunch of ways. Um, lots of people don't like him, and I can kind of see why. Um, he tends to wade into a place with a bunch of ideas that he holds very strongly and then somehow actually managed to get them implemented and delivered and in your face. And if you don't like them, it's very hard to get him to change his mind. Um, the thing is that I've just described a whole lot of people in open source. 
Um, one thing I have, think you have to admire about him is that he does actually get this stuff done. I mean, for someone to show up to his management and say, hi, I want to rewrite init, and I think we should do it like this, and for them to go, no. And for him to go, no, 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 no just wait. <coughs> and to actually go do it, and to have it be so successful that it spread outside his own project into a whole bunch of other major Linux projects, I think that actually is quite impressive. Um, the other thing that, I've, that I saw is that there are a bunch of cases where he's dealing with bugs where he does actually remain incredibly polite given the amount of stuff that's being thrown at him. There's a famous bug where it looked like um, systemd was misparsing a username that started with a digit and using the digit, which was zero, as a user ID. And it turned out that it was actually not being read as a, uh, uh, it was being interpreted as an invalid username. And there's a long discussion about the validity of usernames. And while it does get quite rule lawyery at points, um, he never goes into name calling. He's never calling people idiots. And that, when you're facing that kind of stuff, is quite admirable given the amount of things like death threats he's got over this, which is not cool. Um, Another one is it's not portable. Um, it's aggressively Linux specific, um, which is true. Um, and that means that you have this fear that it's going to alienate other platforms um, if other third party software becomes inherently dependent on it. Um, but it does gain a bunch of important functionality from this. And this also brings together a rather uncomfortable truth. Unix is kind of, as a concept, dead. Unix used to be this, this pathological profusion of operating systems that meant that we all had to be careful because you might be writing your thing on OpenBSD, but someone might want to run it on AX. Not anymore. AX isn't there anymore, as far as most people are concerned. Neither is HPUX, neither is Solaris, to some extent. Um, and so Linux, because they are in such a dominant position in the industry now, can basically do whatever they like. And that can be a bit scary for those of us who then have to think about how we interact with that, but it can also be a bit freeing because we get to be equally liberated. We don't have to care about POSIX as much anymore if we don't want to. I'm not saying we should throw it all out, but I'm saying that we shouldn't use it as a reason to block things. For example, one of the things that I think um, uh, that SystemD uses to quite great effect is C groups. C groups, uh, for those who haven't seen them, are a Linux mechanism for grouping processes <coughs> together so that you can then control them in various ways. They're kind of like just the process grouping functionality of jails. Um, but then you can hang jail-like isolation off that. You can hang resource constraints off that. You can do a whole bunch of things. And the other neat trick with C groups that systemd uses is that instead of the way that launchd manages a process, systemd manages a C group. And if your process is in that C group, it can't ever escape, and neither can its children. And so systemd can actually kill off all processes involved with the service very effectively without any of them managing to escape through double fork tricks. Another thing that systemd does quite well is user level units. If I want to start a service at boot as a user on FreeBSD, for argument's sake, um, I could either become root and install an RC script that runs it as me, but that requires me to be root. Or I can use a trick in cron for, I think there's an at boot or something like that thing that can start it. But again, that's not going to restart it. Systemd, I can write a unit file, put it in a directory in my home directory, load it, and I now have a restartable service like my IRC bouncer. And the thing is, systemd, in a whole bunch of these ways, represents change. And a lot of it, which brings us to the actual tragedy of the piece. Um, change can be scary, especially when it's not under your control. And it's really scary when it threatens things that you find familiar. And I think as, you know, the kinds of people we are, we have a really complicated relationship with the familiar. We love with the familiar and with change. We love changing things when we're doing it. Um, when someone else tells us don't change that, we go, no, 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 wait, it's good. But when they come over to us and say, you should change this, we go, no, no, hold on, <coughs> hold on. Um, and system D represents a lot of disruptive change. Um, and part of the problem with that is that getting a whole community to change, that's really hard. And it results in a kind of knee-jerk reaction to it. And 
the problem with those kind of knee jerks is that they lead to things like abuse. And that's not cool. You might not like system D, but that doesn't mean you need to you know, go and send death threats to Leonard. I've never seen any of that coming from any of the BSD camps, which is great. But what I do see is contempt. Contempt isn't cool. Mocking system D is the wrong attitude to take. It's not the kind of sad thing that Linux people have to deal with and how, how sorry we are for them that they have system D. We should be looking at going, why did they choose to do that? And what I really find problematic is using system D as a recruiting tool for BSD. I don't think that that should be done at all. Because when you think about the kind of people that we would bring across, if we were to say, come to, come to BSD, we don't change. <laughs> or come to BSD, we don't have system D, oh, but we've just come up with a really good idea for saying it works like it. Um, I don't think that those are the kind of people that we, you know, we don't want to bring that attitude into our, our thing. And what, again, what I said we should be doing instead is asking why did they see this as necessary? And the thing is that if you look at it like that, if you don't see it as all oh, those poor Linux people with their terrible init system and go, hang on, they just did that and I don't understand it. Why did they do that? What did they see in it? That means that we can then look at that and start to find things that we can get out of it. And, all, and the other thing to be careful of is the next generation of people, the people that come after us, they don't think the way that we think necessarily. A lot of the people who are now coming into you know, IT and software engineering, they're so much more used to APIs and not lib library APIs, uh, remote procedure call APIs. Um, they grok things like containers in ways that may seem quite unfamiliar to us. That doesn't mean that containers are bad, and it certainly doesn't mean that containers are something that should be mocked. I heard someone describe Kubernetes as the POSIX of the cloud. And while that may sound ridiculous at first, I think it's a scary thought when you think about the fact that we can't run Kubernetes. Um, which brings us to the final section. What can we get from systemd? I'm not saying that we should adopt it. I don't think that, you know, I think trying to directly adopt systemd is never going to work for us. I don't think the systemd upstream project cares. That's fine. But picture, if you will, a, a BSD system with a first-class message transport. This could be Mark, but Mark has its own set of issues importing across. Um, in my mind, the, the main part of the message transport that we could do better than systemd is, is have it be kernel-based. Because that way we can trust that if there's a, there's a user ID in the message saying this came from this user, that we know that it actually did because the kernel put it there. The kernel could also put things like this was the identity of the signed binary that was executing when the message got sent and things like that. Um, on top of that, we can build an RPC framework. Um, again, systemd uses dbus for this. We don't have to. We could. But there's also things like uh, Google's RPC built on top of protobuf, which has a whole bunch of advantages as well. And one question that I can see some people thinking about is why? Because system calls are purely kernel-based. If you're managing a system, you need an API that can talk to both user space and kernel. And so having the RPC framework means you can delegate things like network management out to a daemon and communicate with it to say, please change this. Um, we, it would be very good to have a proper no, uh, notion of a service lifecycle, automated service management, actually restarting services that, that fall over. And all of these things would give us a level of automation via API that would be truly amazing. If you think about something like a PFSense or a FreeNAS, that instead of having to grovel around with interpreting the output from ifconfig, whether through libxo or not, or, but could instead just send messages out to a service bus to say, I'd like to reconfigure things like this now, I think that would be incredibly powerful and would allow a lot more usage of BSD projects in those kind of appliance situations. And the same kind of thing would also make them work on desktops and in a whole bunch of other places. Um, I think we need to look a lot harder at making containers work, um, whether that means we turn jails into C groups or whether we do something else or whether we set off an alarm. That'll be the phone, mate. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, containers I think would be very useful and all of this would give us a BSD system layer. 
In the same way that, that systemd gives one to Linux, we can have a BSD system layer. This doesn't have to be a cross-platform project, but it would be kind of neat if it was. Um, and there are even greater heresies that we could steal from systemd. Systemd's approach to device naming has unpleasant overtones of what I remember as Solaris disk naming with C0, T0, whatever. But it gets you away from the notion that you have to have all your cards plugged in just so, so that the probe order works and EM0 is always EM0. Which would mean that you could then parallelize device probing. Because you don't care what unit number it gets, you then just look at it and go, oh, you're in that slot, I will name you this. And I think that would be very useful. Um, there's a bunch of log and audit event and event handling that is coming in through various projects, but systemd's approach to append only binary logging is not such a silly idea. And the other one that I think would be really interesting to look at, and this is really pie in the sky, when you look at what a macOS and iOS application looks like, it's nothing like what we write. There is a main function, but you never write it. All it does is it instantiates an object, and then instantiates your object, hands it to the application object, and says, off you go now. That, that application delegate object that you create has a bunch of entry points that can say things like, the system's running low on memory, or um, the user just unplugged power, or you're about to go to sleep now, which means you've got a lot more richness in how you can actually, how the application can actually do things. I have no idea what this would look like on our platform, but it's a fascinating thing to think about. And so, at the beginning of this, I put up the Wikipedia definition of tragedy, and it mentioned that it provoked catharsis. Uh, this is the uh, Wikipedia definition of catharsis. A purification or cleansing, um, purging emotions, particularly pity and fear. And what, I'm ho what I hope to achieve out of this talk is purging not just the fear, but the pity of system D. Um, what I hope is that people will go out of here and instead of slagging off system D and the Linux people who use it, have a look at it. See if you can find something you actually like about it. It doesn't have to be all of it, but find some aspect of it that you think would be useful in the project that you work on and see if you can make that happen. Thank you. <laughs>